excellent. I'm like, well, I'm hi everyone. I'm uh, Robert Massey. I'm uh, from the Royal Astronomical Society. I'm deputy director there, and uh, I'll be one of the hosts for this evening's event. Uh, and I'm joined by Stephen Gray from Cosmos Planetarium. Is going to say hello now. Yeah, hello everybody. Yeah, my name is Steve. I'm the cosmic pilot here at uh, Cosmos Planetarium, and uh, we're a mobile dome that travels around Scotland and the rest of the UK, promoting astronomy, space, and in particular dark skies. In fact, the image there behind me is from the Milky Way, from the Isle of Col in our Inner Hebrides, where I am at the moment. I'm doing a session this week for the kids at the school. Fantastic dark skies here when it's clear. Well, nice to meet you all. Thanks, Stephen. Um, quick housekeeping things. This whole session will last about an hour with our, our three wonderful speakers we've got lined up, and you will have a chance to ask them questions. But this being on Zoom, uh, the best way to do that is via the Q&A box if you're on Zoom at the bottom of the screen. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can type them into the chat box there. I'm going to try to cover as many as we can. Don't be disappointed if we don't get through all of them. Some of the speakers might be able to answer them afterwards as well. It just uh, depends on how the time goes. Um, that's the main thing I need to tell you about, I think, as you're aware that National Astronomy Week, I hope anyway, is running right up till this Saturday, and there'll be other events tomorrow about robots on Mars and other things to follow. So without further ado, I'm now gonna hand over to Stephen again, who's gonna introduce the first speaker, but before that, give a tribute to a, a good friend of mine, actually, the late uh, John Brown, uh, Astronomer Royal. Uh, I'm just been told the chat box has popped up up till Sunday. We've got events going till Sunday. Anyway, over to Stephen. Oh. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Robert. Yeah, so uh, just, just, just very quickly to begin with, um, tonight's theme, of course, is, is Tales of Mars through art, uh, music and, and literature. And uh, I just want to take a moment to remember a, a friend of mine uh, who passed away uh, just, just about a year ago. He was an incredible ambassador for, uh, for astronomy, uh, as Robert said there, Professor John Brown. Uh, the Storm of Royal for Scotland. John had an amazing passion for planetariums uh, as a place to tell stories. In fact, he was instrumental in bringing them to Scotland. And I probably wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing uh, if it wasn't for John. He was also uh, an amazing um, talker and um, he could bring science alive using uh, not only his voice but he was also a magician as well so you would often see uh, John at the end of at the end of a session um, inspiring um, inspiring people the public with, uh, with, with combining um, magic along with science the last project he worked on was uh, was amazing it was a project called let's see if I can just uh, show you here a project called Our Big Bra Cosmos. Uh, he wrote in partnership with uh, a Scottish language poet, Rab Wilson. Uh, it's a cocktail of cosmic science, imagery, and poetry. So John, as I said, was an amazing storyteller. And within this book, uh, Rab is, uh, is co-author for this. There's a little poem about John. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so apologies again for that, but uh, we need to we need to crack on. So uh, we're going to begin with our first speaker. Um, and uh, our first speaker is uh, another planetarian, actually. Uh, that's a fantastic <laughs> chap called uh, Josh Yates. So it's a real Josh Josh Yates. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce him. Um, so Josh, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, is a planetarian presenter and educator. Uh, and with a background in puppetry, polar underwater exploration and science communication. Now, that must have been an incredible CV to have. Uh, he takes <laughs> great pleasure in the blending of science and storytelling uh, and particularly enjoys the weird and wonderful worlds of astronomy and the search for extraterrestrial life. Josh, on to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen, for an excellent introduction. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Josh uh, and I'm uh, from uh, Explorodome, a portable planetarium in Bristol and you'd normally find me in uh, in the in the planetarium sharing stories and, and science about space the stars the myths the constellations and hopefully uh, many of you have, have had an opportunity to go and have a look at the night sky recently because it's just brilliant this uh, to me I always refer to this time of year as star spotting season but there are some fantastic things you can see planets uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and of course, Mars. But for the ancient people, the people of, say, ancient Greece and Rome, uh, many thousands of years ago, these weren't planets. These were, these were gods. These were gods. Um, and if you get up really early, you might even catch a glimpse of Venus as well, which is a very conspicuous sight, very bright in the sky. 
So it really is a great time to go out, go out there and have a look. But um, I want to take us back to the time of the ancient Greeks. And to, uh, to the ancient Greeks, Mars was a god called Ares. Venus was a goddess known as Aphrodite. And I always thought that really, you know, gods are gods. Everyone loves gods, right? The people who worship them at least love the gods and they follow them and they build temples to them and they worship them. But that's not always the case and certainly not the case in ancient Greece because um, Mars, or as we should call Mars tonight, Ares, uh, was not very popular at all. Ares is commonly known as the god of war, but actually more than that, he was the god of bloody warfare, of violence. It was said that he was followed around by a sort of blood spattered miasma of fear and dread. He was uh, not well liked at all. Very few temples were built to him and he was not really worshipped that much. Aphrodite, on the other hand, she was the goddess of love, and of beauty and of procreation, we'll call it. And um, Mars or Ares was the son of Zeus and Hera. Even his own father, um, Zeus, said, to me, you are the most hateful of all the gods. He didn't like him at all. But Aphrodite, well, she did kind of like him. Um, and once upon a time, let's say, thousands of years ago, our, our god Ares was walking home, strutting along the street after a particularly violent war. He liked nothing more than a good old fashioned slaughter. When Aphrodite walked out in front of him and said, oh, hello, looked him up and down, gave him the eye, and said, my, my, you, uh, you appear to be covered in blood. Let me, uh, let me get that for you. And she offered to clean the blood from this warrior. And she started wiping it away from his big muscles. She mopped his weary brow. And this cleaning got a little bit intimate because Aphrodite planned to seduce Ares. And she even went as far to say, why don't you, why don't you pop back to mine? Pop back to mine and you can have a proper bath a proper good old fashioned bath and I'll clean you up. I'll clean you up properly. So Ares gladly accepted and off they went back to her place. And um, one thing led to another and I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the lurid details at this time of day, but this was the beginning of a, a romantic involvement. Um, and uh, at some point during this, uh, this meeting, she, dropped a bit of a bombshell because Aphrodite was married. She was a married woman and her husband was Hephaestus. And Hephaestus was the god of metalworking and blacksmithing. But it didn't matter because he was at work and he wasn't due home for hours. So every day after Hephaestus had gone to work, Ares would knock on the door for his morning of nookie, but he, he became quite cautious and he enlisted the help of a young warrior by the name of Electrion. And it was Electrion's job to stand at the front uh, at the bedroom door and uh, keep a lookout to see if Hephaestus would come home early. But on one particular morning, Helios, the god of the sun and also the god of seeing, of sight, wandered past the window and looked through the window of Aphrodite's house and she saw, he saw what was happening. And he wasted no time in telling his friend Hephaestus what was going on. Now you might be expecting a sort of a soap opera kind of style confrontation here, but no, Hephaestus was a more crafty craftsman. He took out his knitting needles and he knitted. And he knitted a net of bronze. This mesh was so fine that you could, you could barely feel it and he lay it across his bed and then went to work. And whilst he was at work, regular as clockwork, Aries turned up, knocks on the door, into the bedroom he goes, Electrion standing outside. But Hephaestus had asked the god Hypnos, the god of sleep, to cast a spell of slumber over Electrion and he fell. 
fast asleep. And that was when Hephaestus made his move. He burst in to the bedroom. And even though they were in the throes of passion, he ensnared them into that net and dangled them high in the air for everyone to see. He called out to the other gods and said, come and have a look, come and poke and point and laugh and prod. And they did gladly. And after the drama was over, Hephaestus let them go. And Ares was pretty annoyed at Electrion, so annoyed for falling asleep on the job that he changed him into a rooster. And from that day onwards, the rooster was destined to wake people from their slumber every single morning. At some point during this time, Aphrodite and Ares uh, managed to uh, have plenty of offspring, amongst which were the, uh, the sons Phobos and Deimos, fetching names that, of course, I mean, this is Ares we're talking about here, um, it was uh, panic and dread, but the moons that orbit around Mars are Phobos and Deimos. So even, even now, um, we use these stories and the names of the characters within these stories to identify things up there in space. And I guess that's the point of telling stories and constellation myths. It's, it's not just, I mean, for us, it's entertainment, um, but it's also a useful way of finding your way around the heavens. It's a, a useful navigation system for us too. And the stories of Mars continue to inspire and, uh, and, uh, and inform artists, musicians all over the world. And I want to share a, a little video uh, with you. Um, I will warn you, this video does contain some flashing light scenes, but it was a video that was made to celebrate the Royal Astronomical Society's uh, 200 year anniversary and also the uh, the uh, 100 year anniversary of Holst's of the Planet Suite being written. Uh, but this is not classical music.
hopefully that worked for you. Um, thank you so much for in, inviting me along for Royal, uh, for National Astronomy Week. It's, uh, it's been great so far. Thank you uh, very much, Josh. Um, we have another Josh on our panel tonight, and that's uh, Josh Knoll, who is the Curator of Modern Sciences in the Whipple Museum of the History of Science at the University of Cambridge. Now, he's going to give us something very different, as uh, you'll see from his video in a second. Uh, he studies Victorian astronomy, and he has a particular interest in debates over life on Mars, which he wrote about in his first book, News from Mars. So over to you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for the invite. Um, yes, as Robert explained, um, I'm a historian of astronomy, uh, and I'm broadcasting live from the Whipple Museum of the History of Science, which is part of the University of Cambridge. And one of the things that the Whipple Museum has, uh, very luckily for me, is an amazing collection of old globes of Mars. And in fact, um, I ended up writing a whole book about Mars because I started researching some of the globes in the collection. So what I thought I'd do this evening is through these globes, I'd show you some globes and use them to uh, explain uh, an episode from the history of Mars, what I think is a really fascinating period in its history. And that's a period when there was widespread debate about whether or not there was life on Mars. And this happened more recently than you might think. Um, the story really for us begins with this globe here. I'll bring it up and give you a nice closer look. Uh, this globe was uh, made in 1871, and so it's based on a map of Mars from 1867. And the map was made by a man named Richard Proctor, uh, a British uh, astronomer and author, very successful, popular astronomer. And as you can see here, this doesn't necessarily look like Mars as we would uh, think it looks today. And that's because in the 1860s, looking at Mars was extremely difficult. Most of the time, it was a very, very small dot in the night sky, even with the most powerful telescopes. Of course, there was no images of what the surface looked like. The only way you could look at it was through a powerful telescope. But about once every two years, Mars comes into what's called opposition, which is where it moves its closest approach to Earth. And in those positions, through a really powerful telescope, Mars might look about as big as the moon looks to us to the naked eye. So imagine if you walked out into your garden and everything that you could know about the moon, you could just know by standing in your garden and looking at the moon. That's the position that astronomers have, but they could only do that for a couple of weeks, every couple of years. And as a result, there was a lot of kind of widespread debate about what Mars looked like and what its surface features might say about whether it was a living or a dead planet. And Proctor believed that Mars was very Earth-like. And so you see on this globe here, you see the, the brown areas are actually land and the green areas are seas and oceans, they're water. And so what you see is that Proctor thought when he looked through his telescope that Mars looked like what he called the twin of the Earth, that it had these big continents, these big seas, and that therefore it was, it was possibly very Earth-like. And in fact, he argued that that probably suggested that it was so Earth-like that it might well actually be inhabited. In 1870, he wrote that the present scene of Mars uh, requires no very lively exercise of the imagination to dot with villages, towns, and cities peopled with busy workers. And the public generally, therefore, welcomed an open debate about whether or not there might be life, including even intelligent life on Mars. And that debate got a lot of impetus a few years later in 1877. Mars came into what is called perihelic opposition. So it came into a particularly good position for observing. I'll pop this up on here. And an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli, working in Milan with quite a powerful telescope, created his own new map of Mars. And this is a globe based on that new map. And if you look on here, Schiaparelli said what he saw was mostly land. So the pale color on this globe is land. And the dark 
areas are water. And he said that actually Mars was mostly land, but it has these narrow strips of water, which he called canali. Uh, in Italian, that can mean either channel or canal, but in English, it tends to get translated as canal. And that got people wondering, well, are these canals? And of course, canals, unlike channels, are, are manufactured artifacts. They are technologies built for moving water around. And as more people began to look at Mars through the 1880s, 1890s, more and more people started claiming that they could see more and more dark straight lines. So this is a globe that was produced in 1898 by the French astronomer Camille Flammarion. Now Flammarion said that the habitation of Mars by a race superior to ours seems very probable. And he thought that the canals were the kind of perfect, uh, the, the clinching evidence for this because he suggested that they looked a bit too ordered and rational to have been made by natural phenomena. But the astronomer who really ran with this idea was an American named Percival Lowell. And this is my favorite object in the Whipple Museum collection. This is a globe based on one of Percival Lowell's maps. And I hope you can see this here clearly. Lowell had absolutely no, uh, said there was no debate about whether these were canals or channels. He said, these are definitely canals. They're definitely artificial. And he said, you can tell they're artificial because they're so straight and they're networks that meet at connecting points, which he said must be cities. And so Lowell constructed a whole ecology for life on Mars. He said, well, Mars is an older planet than the Earth. If the solar system forms from the outside in as, as, as the nebula, nebulous gas condenses, it means that Mars is older than the Earth, which means that Mars, if it's got life on it, that life will be more evolved. So this goes back to this idea of there not only being life on Mars, but it being superior, more intelligent than life on Earth. And so he said they would be capable of grasping the kind of technological prowess you would need to build not just a few small canals, but an entire network of canals that cover the entire surface of the planet. And his argument was that Mars was also an old and therefore a dry dying planet. It had lost most of its water, he said, it was quite cold. And so what they're doing with the canals is that when the polar caps on Mars melt, Lowell said those polar caps were water and that that water would then be channeled through the canals to the equatorial regions where the Martians would actually grow their crops. Now, of course, we now know that those polar caps are carbon dioxide, but at the time they thought that they were water. And so that gave them a good sense that it was a water cycle because the polar caps do grow in the Martian winter and they shrink in Martian summer. And so Lowell constructed this complete uh, ecology, life system, peopled by a superior race of Martians. And he's publishing these accounts from the 18, late 1890s through to the 19 teens. So this is barely 100 years ago that people were having these debates. And Lowell's theories were very controversial. Some astronomers were very upset with Lowell and said that he didn't have the evidence. And some astronomers looked at, the, looked at Mars and said, well, they couldn't see these canals. And it was a huge debate, but it took a long time to disappear. And right up through the 1960s, you start to see uh, canals still on uh, globes and maps of Mars. And it's only really where NASA sends the first probes to take images of the surface of the planet, that the idea of canals on Mars is completely eradicated. And I have it on good um, information from uh, some more senior astronomers that I know that there was great widespread disappointment at the original pictures that were sent back from the early flybys uh, of Mars because they showed a kind of rather arid, uh, desolate planet. And it wasn't as exciting as you see in a globe like this. So anyway, I will finish it there. I hope that um, that gives you uh, some sense of some of the fascinating history of the planet of Mars. It's had an incredible history. This is just one story, one episode, and there are many more out there. And I encourage you to, to seek them out and read about them. Uh, but I will pass back now. I don't know, am I passing back to you, Robert?
I think you are this time, actually, Josh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Um, and I definitely confirm that if you look through a telescope at Mars, it's it's pretty much possible to believe you're seeing a lot of different things when you do that from the Earth. So I don't, I don't blame those early observers for one second. But we should move on. So we've got a chance to ask everybody questions at the end, and I can see those are coming in already. So our next speaker is uh, Luke Cherum, who is an artist based in Bristol, as, by the way, our um, uh, Josh, number one, and myself. We're all weirdly close together, but in the uh, in the Zoom COVID era, we do these things on Zoom. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Luke, who is a well-known artist. I think you know many of you may have seen his Large Moon Project. But um, he has a Mars artwork as well, which has just been built, and which I know he's going to tell us about. Uh, and uh, I think I'm not sure I should say a great deal more other than hand over to Luke at this point, uh, who I'm sure is going to enlighten us on that. So thank you very much, Luke. Good evening. How are you doing? Uh, yes, I'm based in Bristol. I work as an artist. Uh, I'm also, you know, I've studied um, physics and maths, but I'm passionate about science. Um, Let's have the first slide, if that's okay. Uh, someone's gonna be controlling my uh, imagery uh, remotely, which is wonderful. Yes, hopefully may, people may have seen this. This is a replica moon that I've been touring. And I had this idea about 15 years ago to create a replica moon out of high resolution imagery. But back then the printing technology wasn't available and the data wasn't available either. So this is made of uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter mission data and it's a, yeah, it's a balloon with a light in, effectively, uh, with some clever seams and a few other bits and pieces. But I, the moon has acted as a cultural mirror to society, to humanity, uh, from the beginning of time, really. Um, so we've sort of reflected our hopes and dreams and wishes onto the moon. And the moon's been used as a, a, a light time, uh, night, a light source. Um, it's used as a calendar. Uh, huge amounts of our culture have been inspired by the moon um, uh, and in, in every culture around the world. So if you have, um, if we present this artwork in China, the, the, the significance of it in relation to the Mid-Autumn Festival is quite different to if I take the moon and I take it to America, where the people think about the Apollo moon missions. So the interpretation, it, it changes um, and there's significance for the moon in, in lots of religions around the world as well. Let's have the next um, next slide. So and again wherever this artwork is presented its interpretation is slightly different so you put it in a swimming pool you can swim out underneath the moon and moon bathe which is a very nice thing to do whereas you know I put it into science museums um, but also put it into cathedrals and um, churches as well so that interpretation will shift depending on where we present it. Let's have the next slide. And it's probably one of my most successful artworks. We've had 150 exhibitions now in about 30 countries right around the world, and about 10 million people have seen it. We had 2.1 million people went to see it at the Natural History Museum in, in within nine months, something like that. It became the most uh, sort of successful exhibits there. And I was very aware that people aren't going to see my artwork. They're going to, to have their close encounter with the moon. Uh, a little girl came up to me and it asked if, if I would put the moon back afterwards because uh, she thought I'd stolen the real moon. I thought that was really nice. And I've also had sort of uh, space scientists, people who've been studying the moon for decades, come in, in tears, you know, uh, where they're having this sort of emotional impact and their close encounter with the moon and they needed a hug. Uh, because they were sort of so overwhelmed after spending decades studying the surface of the moon. Um, to be actually going to see it up close is quite something. Let's have the next slide. So this is a, a short film that just shows its sort of impact. Um, let's play this. to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept.
It's the middle of the day and it's a beautiful sunny day outside. But in there it's dark, kind of blue, it feels like night time. Got families lying down, just watching with their kids. It's, yeah, it's, it's a very different atmosphere to the outside world right now. As I came in, my first reaction was, wow, absolutely wow. And then also the, the surroundings of the Great Hall, because, and to see the people all enjoying themselves and finding it interesting. I didn't expect to see people laying on the floor, just chilling out, which is quite nice. The idea behind the Museum of the Moon actually came from living in Bristol. Bristol's got the second highest tidal range in the whole of Europe. So there's a 13 metre gap between high tide and low tide, and it's the moon that's making that happen. The amazing thing about the moon is it acts as a cultural mirror. So every culture has different stories and mythologies uh, and stories to tell about the moon. The more you let your eyes just sit and focus on it, the more it looks real. It was amazing. You thought it was amazing, did you? Yeah. Why did you think it was so amazing? Because there was aliens. Because there were aliens? And it was very exciting and a very uplifting visual experience. It was really big. Was it? What did you like about it? It had lots of craters on. Did it? And what did it feel like when you were underneath? It felt like it was falling on us. Did it? Really? I thought it was very peaceful and calming. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think it's got this incredible, there's such a simplicity to the idea, but it's got this amazing, imposing nature, and it's just exquisitely delivered. I think it's a great piece. It's the fact that I've got the imagination going, it's fantastic, you know? It's really good. I actually saw aliens. You did see aliens, okay. She saw the aliens. Okay. Let's have the next slide, please. There we are. So just as a way to sort of, I had an opportunity, you know, once I developed that technology to create that artwork, um, I thought, well, what would, the, what would the earth look like? And so it just felt inevitable to be able to create that. There's something called the overview effect that's really important as well, where astronauts look down at the earth and they can see, they have a sort of emotional response to seeing the earth from space. Um, and they often come back to earth and become um, ambassadors for, for the, saving the planet for environment for, for sort of environmental history um so that's one of the reasons i, I made this earth I, I'm, I'm conscious of time so let, let's say i've crack on with the next slide and we may as well play this uh follow it this is houston uh it's a good picture of the horizon uh, we can't see many terrain features as yet uh, Apollo 8 Houston, we're beginning to pick up a few uh, craters uh, very dimly. The whole thing is pretty bright. Roger, there's not much definition up here either out of the horizon. We're now approaching the uh, crater C and Bandit. I was immediately moved to tears. My daughter said to me, why are you crying? I said, I'm not crying, I'm just humbled. It was very cool because um, it was really big and you could lie underneath it and have photos where you hold it. You come off the busy street and everyone just stops and there's like a sense of stillness as it's spinning around really slowly. I just felt really like proud in a weird way as well. All of your senses are, are, are involved. It was amazing. You know, you come from normal life and then you get this little glimpse of something behind the door and then you walk into this amazing dark room. My name is Luke Jerram and I'm the artist behind the Gaia Earth artwork. Humanity has been staring at the moon for 200,000 years. The moon has inspired so much music and mythology and literature and every culture right around the world. Whereas it's only been 50 years that, that humanity has been able to see our planet, planet Earth, from space as a, as a blue marble floating in the blackness of space. I was so mesmerised by it. It's quite awe-inspiring, really. That mixture of fragility and, and strength that is there. We were thinking about how small we were. And it feels like I'm on, on, I'm on the moon and I'm looking at the Earth. It makes us wonder perhaps what we're doing to our world, what it'll be like for our children's children. It's probably the first time that my son has seen the world in that sort of context. He doesn't understand yet, but he will one day. It makes you feel very small. <laughs> I think we need to, to save the world. <laughs> I'm hoping when people come and see this Earth artwork, they'll realise the beauty and the fragility of our planet and that actually it's our only home and we really have to look after it.
If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Together, we can make real change happen. The interpretation of of the Earth and the Moon are quite different. Quite different, even though they're the same dimension of these objects. Um, and what I'm doing, I'm sort of shrinking, you know, making the Moon we made was um, half a million times smaller than the real thing. So we're shrinking something, but at the same time, you've got something quite large in front of the audience, and that's quite interesting. But also, both those artworks they leave space for the public to talk to one another about what they're seeing. Um, so leave space for other people's conversations. They come with a surround sound composition by a composer called Dan Jones, who's also based in Bristol. Um, and the, the music, uh, yeah, you just heard a bit of um, this United Nations speech uh, uh, by Attenborough. Um, but you also got NASA um, recordings there as well. Um, and so, yeah, I was invited to make a Mars artwork by a museum over in uh, in Holland, and um, and and this one is made of the MRO data, and it's it's a kind of an interesting thing, you know. We, we've got a, a you know a two hundred thousand year history of staring at the moon and wondering about it, whereas Mars has been seen as a kind of red moving uh, star. Uh, it was only in the sort of um, early 1600s that people were able to look at it and notice differences and in the, in the, you know it's obviously been a red moving star but you know for it to be seen as a planet to have an emotional connection with it is it's only somehow been quite recent it feels that way anyway um so to see it up close is quite something um let's uh, let's play play the film and we get a sense of that Oh, just the next slide would be great. Thank you. Oh, there we are. Actually, go go back and see uh, go and see that slide. So you you can see um, you've got these darker patches which had previously been interpreted as as seas, uh, and then you've got all the craters, the sort of craters that the moon has as well. Um, but what you might be able to tell, but it's certainly when looking at the artwork up close, you can see evidence of water on the surface where rivers used to be. Um, they're, they're, it feels that, that that evidence is there when you're looking at the artwork. Um, you can also see kind of um, lava channels as well, um, but it's a very nice a very nice thing. And then again, this illusion of texture is created as well. So this is a flat object. It's a balloon with a, a fan in and a, and a light um and some special seams uh so let's have the let's have the next slide so i tested this artwork out uh early march just about a week before the lockdown um we took it to a sports hall and invited a few friends just before the lockdown so uh, it, it's not actually been presented yet in the uk i'm looking forward to presenting it if anyone's interested in me presenting it uh in a museum perhaps when when museums open that would be great uh, let's have this next film.
absolutely amazing. I mean, I yeah, I listen to Mars quakes every day. I look at the data from Mars every day, but to see Mars right there in front of me and to be able to walk around it and look at all the the faults and the craters and the the ancient volcanoes, it's just like. I, well, I've been there, stood there for an hour and I could stay all night. My children are like, when are we going home? <laughs> We're not going home. <laughs> We're just going to stand here and look at Mars. So, yeah, unbelievable. It's amazing. Definitely lived up to my standards. Not that I had standards, but I was not expecting it to be as amazing as it is, honestly. It's so cool just to have the entire plan view of Mars in front of you. It's like, wow, <laughs> just mind-blowing, honestly. It's really cool. Yeah, so there we go. Um, on 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 that scale, the, um, the Olympus Mons would be about an inch high off the surface of that uh, seven meter sphere. So I'm kind of tempted to sort of add little pockets to kind of create those those uh, ancient volcanoes that are surfaced there. Anyway, I'm going to hand you back now to um, to Robert. But it's been lovely speaking with everyone, and I hope. Um, one day to be able to present artworks in museums again whenever they open uh, soon. <laughs> Thanks very much. Wow, that was uh, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, three amazing speakers. Uh, it was it was brilliant fun to explore the mythology, history, and art of uh, of Mars in particular, and and the wider cosmos. There, I'm lucky enough to have seen uh, Luke's uh, moon installation at the uh, UK Space Conference last year. It was fantastic to see it in in person. If you get a chance, well worth a look. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we're now going to uh, start to take some questions here. Um, so just give me a second. We will uh, we'll tee up the first one and uh, we'll go from there. Um, so the first question we have is from uh, Spiderweb. And uh, I think this one is probably to, to Josh uh, Nail. Uh, no. um, it's, um, does Olympus Mons appear on any of those Victorian globes? It's a good question. Yes, you can hear me. Good. Um, yeah. So for those who are wondering, Olympus Mons is the largest mountain in the solar system. It's a very large volcano on Mars. It's about two and a half times as high as Mount Everest. It does not appear on any of these globes. The first time that Olympus Mons is identified is when Mariner 9 flies by Mars, uh, as I said, in the early 1960s and images. The planetary feature that we still recognize that does appear on all of these globes is a much larger feature and that is what we call Certis Major and you might recognize it if you look on any globe of Mars you'll see this thing that looks a little bit like a tornado like a dark pointed tornado um, that's Certis Major it's a very 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 um, large geological um, feature and that was large enough in fact that Christian Huygens had identified it in the 17th century but it is the one commonality across these globes if you look um, there you can see whereas Lowell has it in green because Lowell thinks that it's vegetation uh, for example um, so they can agree that there is something dark and pointy there um, but even that the argument is is um, uh, is different but that's the only really obvious feature um, everything else, including a ginormous volcano, is too small to see. Okay, I'm going to take the uh, next question. So we've got one from Terry Mosley, which I think is for Josh Knoll as well. Uh, there was a great desire to think there was life on other planets, yet that's <clears throat> basically incompatible with the Genesis story. Since religious belief was stronger in the 18th and 19th century, what was the rationale for the extra belief in extraterrestrial life? That is another excellent question. Um, it's, it, was a, it was a hotly debated topic within Christian theology, and it really came down to whether you took a literal interpretation of the Bible or not. By a literal interpretation of the Bible, there's no mention of extraterrestrial life. And therefore, that branch of Christian interpretation would say that, that life only exists on Earth. However, there was a very strong strand of Christian theological belief that actually promoted the idea of extraterrestrial life on an, basically an argument of plenitude. Our, the argument is that God wouldn't create such a vast universe and leave it almost completely barren and only put life on one uh, 
uh, planet, that in actual fact, because of the glory of God's creation is everywhere, life will be everywhere. So if you look at a Scottish um, evangelical Presbyterian like David Brewster, very famous 19th century science, he wrote a whole book um, arguing for life throughout the universe on Christian grounds based on the idea that God wouldn't, wouldn't waste um, so much of the universe. So it was a hot topic and um, Christian theology was wrapped up in also what astronomers were arguing. So that's a really excellent question. Yeah, that was uh, that was fantastic uh, explanation there. Um, so I think we have time for uh, maybe another question or two. Uh, the next one I have here is from an anonymous attendee. Um, were later astronomers seeing canals because they were conditioned by Schiaparelli's observations, or did they have uh, scratched eyepieces on their telescopes? I presume I should take this one as well. It's another excellent question, um, a very perceptive question. Yes, this idea that many, many astronomers were claiming to see these canals and how could they all be so wrong? Well, it wasn't because they all, all had scratched eyepieces, but what you imply with the start of your question is very astute, which is that once someone has seen a feature and mapped it, it's very easy for other people to, to, to think that they're seeing the same thing. And indeed, as Robert said earlier, when you look at Mars, even through a modern telescope, really good telescope, the surface can play tricks on you. And there's a lot of changing variation of light and shade. In fact, we now know, of course, for example, that there are big dust storms, which actually do change the surface appearance. And therefore, people like Lowell were never claiming that they saw all the canals at the same time. They were claiming that they would see one or two canals and then it would go away and then they would see another one. And so Lowell would make lots and lots of maps and then he would combine them into one map and say that basically because of the complexities of observation, you never see the whole network. And so other astronomers would say, oh yes, well, I didn't see all of that, but I did see a straight line going between these two points. And so it kind of got built up. And as you say, I think the power of suggestion was really quite um, important in, in that. Okay, hey, thanks very much. Thanks, Josh. Do you have other question? I've got, yeah, I'm gonna answer one myself, which is from Iris age five, and she's asking how hot Mars is. Um, I had a good idea about this, but my colleague Sharon, you can't see, has checked uh, minus 63 degrees on average, so pretty chilly. That's a very cold bit of Antarctica. 20 degrees C or so at best at noon on the equator, and minus 153 degrees C at the poles. So pretty cold on the whole, uh, Iris. Um, there's also actually an astrophysics one about impact craters um, we might come to, but bluntly, I think most of the impact craters were formed before the, or uh, after the oceans, and you can see that because otherwise they wouldn't be there, they'd be smoothed out, but there is lots of evidence of water on Mars and its ancient past. Um, now, let me, we've got a question for uh, Josh Yates which is from Elizabeth Stanway, which is, do audiences respond more strongly to the ancient stories we tell of Mars or to the things we've learnt about it more recently? <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the themes that run through, um, that run through the ancient stories are, um, are familiar stories even to this day. And uh, certainly if you're familiar with the story of Perseus, uh, Andromeda. Um, uh, they've been reimagined as the story of Percy Jackson. For anyone who's got um, children, they, you might be familiar with Percy Jackson, again, based on um, the Percy story. So I guess um, the, the, the stories, the content of the stories and the story arcs, the storylines are, are very much the same then as they are now. And but like all stories, certainly word of mouth stories, you know, following the oral tradition, um, they do tend to evolve over time. And I guess the the future stories of Mars will be um, will be ones of of the, uh, the 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 brave people that were, that were sent there that may may or may not come back again. So um, I think to answer that, I guess the the question was um, about whether they respond more strongly to those ancient stories. I think. Well, yes, because actually the story themes are are the same as they are now. We might change names, we might change a few items within that story, but the overall story and the, the feelings that you get from those stories are very much the same. 
Fantastic. Uh, we actually have two questions here, one from Martin and one for, from Julia, but the, uh, they're, they're both for Luke and they're, they're quite similar. So I'll just ask them both at the same time here. So uh, Luke, Saturn would be good, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. My personal favourite planet visually, and uh, that was from Martin and for Julie. Uh, would Luke like to do our installations for all of the planets? Yeah, I've, I, I, it's interesting. It's whether whether the data is available. That's one thing to consider. Um, it's actually quite difficult, I think. So something like Saturn, to try to create, you're taking photographs of something simultaneously uh, or to be able to sort of stitch all those images together, it's not an easy thing. Um, but it's also whether the public would would respond to it in the same way. You know, when we when we look at the Earth, we have a very emotional response because we know we've, we've, we're dealing with COVID at the moment. We've we've got environmental problems. There's a sense of connectedness. We've got a, we've got an understanding on it. Whereas if we if I made a sculpture of say Mercury, you know, how are people going to respond to it? Are there are is there going to be that level of interest? Obviously, astronomers, a lot of people will get quite excited by it, but um yeah so it's you know it's whether it's worth doing there's a bit of that uh, whether the time's right i think one of the reasons i wanted to make a mars is that we're sending there's lots of missions to mars there's going to be more and more interest in mars over the coming years as we land on it and you've got a new mission going there looking for that will be drilling into the surface looking for water and life uh so uh, it, it felt like the right time to make Mars, whereas, you know, making perhaps Pluto, you think, well, you know, if, are people going to respond to it emotionally in the same way? Will it have that impact? So I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. I'm working on all sorts of other projects as well, as well as these uh, astronomical ones as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, hopefully we do get a, a few more planets um, somewhere down the line. That would be amazing. Yeah, that would be, um, that would be great, Luke. Yeah. I'm sure we'll welcome that. Uh, I've got a couple more I think we're going to try and take um, because we're, we're happy to run on very slightly over. Um, there's one which I think is for Josh H, which is, did the Greek and Roman mythology change both civilizations' perspective and views on the planets? <laughs> um uh, very much so. I, I think it's worth probably remembering that to, to, to the ancient uh, civilizations that that looked up and, and told these stories, these weren't just stories. These were this was a religion. This was this was something that that motivated them to uh, live in a certain way, behave in a certain way, um, and and you know, build build uh, temples and all sorts of things to uh, to worship them. So. Absolutely, the, their belief was was fervent and and evident, uh, and has been left in the in the record of, of archaeology and uh, you know the written literature as well. So yes, absolutely, the um the 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 uh, these stories and these um, mythologies informed the way of life for these people definitely. Great, fantastic. Well, I think we should probably uh, bring this more or less to a close now. It's slightly over. I'm just looking at the. The list of questions there's more support for you doing saturn here luke you'll be pleased to know uh and uh various other questions actually astrophysics we probably can't answer now because I don't yeah think... i would like to make uh, a saturn i think the, the imagery is extraordinary so maybe that's next on the cards the, the artworks have been sort of partially funded by the uk space agency as well as science museums and different organizations coming in chipping in to be able to make this artwork um so i'm very grateful to, to them and their, for their support Excellent. All right. Well, uh, thank you. So I guess it just remains for me to thank all the fantastic speakers we've had this evening. Um, do any of you want to say any final words about this? Any thoughts for uh, people on the call? No? Or uh, we can move just on. Thanks for the, the great questions. It's been brilliant, hasn't it? I really appreciate thank this. You. Thank you to Lucinda and Sharon in the background who are organising mm -hmm. all this and have been doing a, a frankly brilliant job all week. Uh, so I think at this point, we now get to uh, go and relax and we hand oh. over the, um, the remote observers. And there's a Mars book he's holding up there. There's a Mars book. It's not my Mars book, but it, it's um, it's a very good book. It talks about the history of uh, of Mars and its its culture um, throughout the centuries. So it's highly recommended, although I'd like to hear your book, uh, Josh. I'd, you'll have to post the uh, the details of your book because you're very eloquent about this. So yeah, yeah well, I, but that, that, that William Sheehan book is an excellent place to start. I co-sign that. It's, it's, it's probably the best general history. Mine's a bit more specific to the late 19th century. Um, so yes, I, I, it's very good. 
Okay, very good. All right, and uh, just to remind everybody, apart from the remote observing now, which I strongly recommend you hang in for, because I think there will be clear views from at least parts of the uh, the UK and Ireland, and, and we have we also have backup in Cyprus too. Do join us tomorrow when I think we're doing robots on Mars. So some of the exploration that's already happened, and I'm very much looking forward to that. But other than that, thank you everybody, and we very much appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Well, I guess it's over to the practical observers now. Hi, I'm Robin Schedule. I, I always forget to plug my organisation, which is the Society for Popular Astronomy. There, it's been done now. It's been one of those dank, wet November days that uh, Thomas Hood wrote a poem about. And earlier on, it looked as if it was going to be a total washout in terms of observing. But I just looked outside and I looked on the satellite map and what would you know? It's actually clear here in, in Buckinghamshire. And I know that for some of, of our observers, it is clear as well, which is great because we have been uh, been able to see the Mars courtesy of Agapios in, in Cyprus recently, and he's done some great observations, but we're hoping to get some homegrown observations of our own. And mentioning Agapios, one thing I wanted to show you, I'm going to share my screen now if I can, and um, I wanted to show you this, um, this picture of Mars, which he's taken. And here it is, there. Hope you can see that now. And um, is it coming through? Someone tell me. Uh, I see um, a list of files, JPEGs. Oh, right. OK. Well, um, this is this is wonderful. This is Zoom for you, isn't it? I click on the right file and uh, hang on. I'll stop sharing screen and, and start again with that one. We can see it in the lower left corner, Robin. Yes. But not, not fully. There we go. How about that? Yes, perfect. Right. Okay. A lot better. Good. Okay. Now you'll see that uh, uh, these are pictures from Agapios in Nicosia in Cyprus. Now, uh, at the start of the week, November the 14th, this is the view he got of Mars. And I should point out that Mars rotates in almost exactly the same time as Earth does. So the two planets go round together in the same time more or less very in, in 24 hours and 37 minutes in the case of mars so we're in from the uk and indeed from uh, nicosia you see the same view of mars pretty well each night so that's why over successive nights uh, agapios has been able to view more or less the same part of the sky uh, of mars now you see here's mars and look over in this bottom right hand corner and it's uh, just the mare serenium uh, serenium uh, not much to see there but two days later notice these fingers of bright area here these are this is a dust storm which has developed just in a matter of a couple of days and last night you can see that the dust storm had changed and these pictures were taken with two different telescopes that he's got access to and so the smaller ones are with his smaller telescope so that shows you what's been going on on mars and this is quite exciting because dust storms on mars are fairly infrequent they can sometimes envelop the whole planet, in, the, in which case observers see absolutely nothing at all. And that's happened on a few occasions recently. But uh, we are hopeful that we will be, get, be able to get something tonight. So I'm going to stop the share there. And now we're going to go around the uh, around the country uh, and indeed over to, to Ireland. I'm going to start talking to just uh, introduce each person in turn. Uh, can we have a word with uh, Dave Eagle? Dave, can you come in now, please? Tell us where you are. Hello, Robin. I'm in Northamptonshire, so in about the middle of the country. Um, we've got a clear sky. It's a bit gusty, and I've got Mars on the camera at the moment. So uh, we've got some live views coming in. Right. I'm hoping you'll be clear for a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, let's go over to John Dolan, who's in Ireland. John, come in and uh, introduce yourself. Unmute yourself if you would. You're still muted. I'm still muted. That's it. Yes. Hello. Yeah, it's conditions really are, 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 have been, over the last hour, they have been clear, but very gusty. 
and uh, seeing is terrible, very bad. And uh, the clouds have, are, are now moving in. So, uh, you know, but it's, it's lined up there. But uh, the clouds, I think, are going to, and rain is promised over the next uh, little while. But in any case, uh, there we go. That's the condition. So I'm in North Dublin and uh, welcome to everybody. Right, we'll, we'll come back to you in a short while. I'll just introduce the other guys. We've got yeah. Ian Sharp, who's down in Sussex, uh, on the south coast. Ian, how are you? Very well, thank you, Robin. Uh, apart from the weather, I'm taking refuge again into in my office and um, because the weather's blowing a hooli here and it's 100% cloudy. But um, so, uh, I, but I've got some uh, tips and tricks to share with uh, the viewers uh, from, from here in my office a bit later, if that's okay. Good. And our final observer is over on the East Coast. It's John yeah. Press. Hi, uh, John. How's things there? Oh, fine. Thank you. It's a very cloudy, though, and a little bit windy, hoping it's going to clear up shortly. Looking at the satellite photographs, it's uh, the wind blowing in the right direction. Super. OK, well, it looks like Dave Eagle is our man to give us some live views of Mars. So let's go back to Dave and over to you. OK, thanks, Robin. OK, so let me just share my screen. Uh... <laughs> So, yeah, so can you see that? That's the live view yep. coming off the telescope at the moment. That's using an 11 inch uh, Celestron C11 uh, with a video camera on there. So you can see some of the dark features on it and typical of uh, observing planets. The atmosphere is causing it to <clears> wobble <throat> all over the place. Um, so you get these momentary periods of really clear seeing where you see the details. So you might see occasionally the south, the south polar cap down here will pop into view very briefly um, and you see bright areas and dark areas on the planet and of course it's wobbling around because of the earth's atmosphere and the scope's not properly cooled down yet either because it's only just gone out because just over an hour ago it was raining here is, is that the dust storm i can see there as just well? down here on the yes, right hand side yes. that, that bright area yes. is the dust storm so i've taken a few pictures um so i'm hoping i can process those to bring that out a little bit more and if you're quite observant and look at the shape of mars because it's a, just over a month past opposition you can actually it's not quite a full disc now it's looking like a moon just before it becomes full so it's what we call gibbous uh, so it's got this it's starting to develop a bit of a phase there. So you can see this side is a different shape to this side on here. But as you can see, it's wobbling about quite a bit. One, because of the atmosphere and two, because the wind's buffeting the telescope in the garden. Nevertheless, that's still quite an impressive image, given the circumstances. People might wonder why it's in motion so much, uh, because you, you would yeah. think that uh, it's a nice clear night. Uh, what's what's the problem? Actually, I, th I think probably something we could talk about in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, you've got a nice uh, sky view there, I can see. Um, yeah, this is my wide sky view, so you can see uh, this is the W or M shape of Cassiopeia, depending on the time of year you're looking at it. Over here, this is the square of Pegasus. And over here, you've got Cygnus just starting to disappear, the Northern Cross here. And you can maybe just about see the Milky Way. So this is a wide angle camera. Um, I'm sitting in here looking at that to make sure that no clouds come across and starts raining again, in which case I'll have to dash out and grab the telescope <laughs> and shut everything up. That looks pretty good. That looks yeah, pretty, so pretty good. good at the moment. So I'm keeping an eye out on the clouds. And so, uh, and the, the the thing is that people look outside and see a lovely clear sky and say, oh, it looks like a wonderful night for astronomy. But as you've shown, if you're actually trying to observe something quite small like Mars, which is about 17 seconds of arc across at the moment, which is really quite tiny, then the atmospheric turbulence that's in our own atmosphere causes a lot of problems and it's jiggling around. It's quite high up. Uh, that's one reason we chose National Astronomy Week to be now rather than when the planet was larger, because when the planet was larger uh, and closer to Earth back in October, uh, about uh, six weeks ago, it was at its closest. We had the problem that it was only really high up about one midnight or one in the morning. That's partly because the planet 
uh, was uh, was in the position of the planet, but also because we were still in uh, summertime at the time, and we thought that midnight was not a good time for getting people together to watch Mars. So that's why we're here now. And it's actually quite high, high up in the sky, but it's still jiggling around because of our atmosphere. This is due to our old friend, the jet stream, which we know a lot about from the, watching the weather forecast and weather conditions such as those we have at the moment, which are lots of fronts coming through, are typical of a strong jet stream over the country. And when we get that, we also get this sort of jiggly seeing, as we call it, the planet all over the place. But there are tricks we can do, and I'm, I guess that uh, Dave will be able to demonstrate those as to how we can actually get a much better image of, of Mars so that we can actually see some of the details. Um, do you, can you can you uh, process that image for us, Dave? What I can do, I've got a presentation I can show you afterwards. So if you want to go to some of the other guys first, I'll get set up ready for that and have that running after. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, let, let's see how, if, who's got... Uh, clear skies at the moment. Uh, John Dolan, uh, uh, what's the situation with you at the moment over there in Dublin? No, afraid I've just closed, uh, parked my telescope because it started to rain at the moment. Uh, did you manage to get any images earlier on? Uh, no, nothing satisfactory. It was hopping all around the place. In fact, I found it difficult to keep it, it, keep the, it kept hopping out of the frame you know, of the of vision. So, we, you know, with this gusts of wind it was very bad. But um, the seeing was awful as well. So, it, I, you know, I did try to get a few, but it really, it really wasn't worth anything. Yeah, so it looks as if, uh, uh, as, as if Dave, David is the, uh, Dave Eagle is the best, our best bet for seeing yeah. Mars tonight. So we'll stay on that picture. Uh, John, um, uh, John Press, any any improvement in your conditions where you are? Uh, not at the moment. I've just opened the observatory up. It is starting to clear a little bit out to the west, but uh, yeah, nothing at the moment, I'm afraid. Okay, that's that's fair enough. And um, I guess that uh, Ian Sharp is still clouded out down on the south coast. Yes, I'm afraid so, Robin. It's um, it's 100% cloudy out there. I just had a quick, uh, oh, I looked just before we joined this, and uh, there wasn't any sign of uh, clearing. I think in an hour or so after this, uh, after this presentation, it will be clearing. Right. But, okay. Uh, well, over to you, Dave. And um, if you'd like to show us how you get such a wonderful image out of that rather misty and murky one, let's see what that dust storm is me, doing. Um... Let me uh, come out of this, if it will let me. Hold on a second. Okay, can you see the full screen version? I can the... see the full screen now. You see your lovely planetarium, and there's your all sky okay, monitor. So there's the all sky camera. So that's a little planetary camera sitting in there with a wide angle lens sitting on it. So there's there's a close up. So that's what's giving us the views, which most of the time gives us a view like that. Um, but uh, we were lucky enough to actually get a view similar to that so i'm not going to talk too much about that so uh, i'll skip through this bit uh, this is the telescope i've been using which is a celestron c11 so it's 11 inches across it's got a long focal length so it's a long focal length telescope so it's ideal for planets it produces quite big images so you don't have to magnify them quite as much to get a decent image and we use a planetary camera or webcam and we put that in the end to take the images and they take a video and a video is a long stream of images and as you saw the images jumping about and wiggling all over the place so you get some really really bad images and some really really good images and we run that video through software and that sorts all the videos all the images that make up that video into really good ones and really bad ones it throws away the really bad ones and keeps all the good ones and it stacks them together. And the noise that's inherent in the picture, because it's composed of lots and lots of different images, the noise is random in each image. So any features on the, in, on the planet get um, intensified and all the noise gradually smooths out. And we use a series of uh, software to do that. But we have to process them. So this is the sort of thing we saw and uh, you saw that earlier. So this is Mars taken some weeks ago and you can see the polar cap quite nicely on a bit of a better night. It's still jiggling about quite a bit. You can see some of the dark features and this big dark triangular area called Certis Major. 
And if we take that image and we process it using the uh, stacking software, this is the sort of image we can get out of that data. So that data is all in there and we can get that out using um, that software, which is fantastic from a um, planetary imaging point of view. But of course, Mars changes in size. Now, our position was on the 13th of October. So here I've got a simulation of what Mars has done throughout the year. And you can see in January, it was fairly small. I didn't actually start to image it until April. So here it is, a really bad image. It was really low down and really small, but I had a go anyway. And then throughout May and June, it started to get bigger. And then July, and of course, I was distracted around that time because there was a great comet around. So I didn't go and do much many planets for a while so it took me till August to actually get back onto Mars so here's an image I took back in August and you can see that the south polar cap was actually quite big then but it's now pointed towards the sun so it's becoming summer in the southern hemisphere of Mars so that has gradually shrunk as time goes by so by the time we got to September you can see just how big it was so here's an image I took on the 14th of September through that same telescope and you see the dark features, you can see the polar cap has shrunk quite a bit, and you can even see uh, Valles Marineris, this huge canyon on the surface of Mars there as well. And then October, when it was at opposition, you see just how much bigger it got as the distance between Earth and Mars got less. Um, but I didn't get quite as good a picture then because the seeing conditions weren't quite as good. So, uh, you know, I had to contend with what I got. Uh, so that was probably one of my best images around that time. And then, of course, during November and December, it's going to get much smaller. So here's one I took um, on the 6th of November. And that's the last chance I've had until tonight, by the looks of it, uh, to get another image. And you, again, you can see Certis Major, this huge triangular shape there. And if you really overexpose Mars, this is Mars, but I've had to really up the... Um, exposure of the image to make it really really bright and you can see these two tiny spots next to it and these are actually its moons Deimos and Phobos but they're really difficult because Mars is so bright compared to them uh, so that was quite a challenge that was something I wanted to do uh, while it was uh, close to us this year and of course if you take a series over time you can see the different faces of Mars so these are some of the different images that I've taken and I've tried to put them in order so that it looks like a rotation of Mars. Okay, do you want me to talk some more, Robin, or do you want to hand well, over to I, I was else? wondering if you could actually process the image, want a sequence that you've taken tonight, and, and let us see how you go through it in, in, in real time, just a, a fairly the short only, sequence. The only problem with that is, um, Robin, it's on the other computer, and that oh. is such a slow computer. What I normally do, I take the images on that computer and then process them on this one. All right, so if you could process one and we'll come back to you, how about that? Is, is okay, that yeah, that's be... great, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll get set up and see if I can uh, get one and uh, process it for you. Okay. Okay, um, so if let's... you come back to me. Yeah. I, we will come back to you in a, in a while. Let's go over to Ian Sharp now. Right, over to you. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so um, what I, I'd quickly share uh, my screen um, and just to uh, introduce myself. Uh, can you see, uh, are you seeing a picture yep. of my telescope? Yep, we are. Uh, okay. Um, basically, uh, I am uh, an astronomer uh, from uh, the south of england um this this is what i wanted to do was to uh, a bit like dave i wanted to use my uh, uh setup as seen in my dome here uh to show you some pictures of mars but unfortunately the weather has put uh, an end to that uh, i saw so i quickly introduced myself uh, it's my homemade dome in in my garden um uh, fiberglass dome that i built um over uh, back in about 2006 uh, lovely skies here um, on the south coast, um, not far from Selzy, um, uh, jutting out to sea on the Selzy Peninsula. Uh, we get very, very flat and lovely horizons. Uh, I do all sorts of imaging. I take pictures of uh, comets. This is uh, Comet Neowise, which uh, thrilled us back in uh, July. Um, I do a lot of photometry. That's measuring 
brightnesses of stars, um, some other pictures of comets I've taken. And I do deep sky imaging of, of uh, nebulae and galaxies. Um, and here's a picture of Jupiter, just to show you that I can take pictures of planets. I, I, I travel with my telescope to look for that elusive good seeing that we've been talking about. Um, some places on the, on, on the planet are better than others. Barbados is very, very good. And here's a picture of um, Jupiter that I took uh, with the 11 inch Celestron back in 2011 and some other images. I, I shall move on um, galaxies. And here's a picture of Mars that I took uh, back in September uh, this year. So um, showing quite a lot of nice detail. Now that was taken in good seeing conditions. Uh, so, uh, and you can see lots of clouds and uh, the South Polar Cap at the top. I've got South at the top there. So, um, and here's some images of Saturn. We are still able to see Saturn at the moment, setting early on in the evening. Here's some images uh, showing the changing tilt of the rings. So these are the kind of images that uh, amateurs can take these days. So what I was going to do was, um, here is a, a picture of my telescope in the dome as it was about an hour ago. I was going to show you a live demonstration of imaging a galaxy, but unfortunately all that has, um, has uh, you know, I'm afraid uh, gone up in smoke. So what I thought I'd do is do a, a little, I'd bring things back to earth a little bit. Um, I think we've had quite a lot of conversations and back in Saturday um, when I was doing the presentation um, a, a few days ago uh, for for the Mars evening, th there's a lot of uh, quite expensive equipment being shown and being used and I, I myself showed um, quite a lot of expensive kit on how to connect things together. And I thought I'd bring it back to Earth a little bit. Um, some of the viewers might be interested in what they might be able to do just with a camera and a tripod um, and maybe some other uh, not quite so expensive equipment. So uh, if, if I can, Robin, I'll, I'll just take my camera, my, yeah, my webcam, and um, I'll, I'll show you what's sitting next to me here. Um, what I've got, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, so um, you're looking Astro at my track. yes, you're looking at my office. Well, what I want to say here is really this is a, a tripod, and this is a, a, a regular uh, DSLR camera. That um, now there's a lot of these on the market at the moment for very good prices because there's a lot of new models being introduced. You can pick these things up second hand. This is a Canon DSLR camera. Um, a couple of hundred pounds and you can get yourself a good one and a lens like this uh, that comes with the camera this is a 50 millimeter standard lens um, so what you can do is you can take uh, rather nice images of the milky way um, and things like comets uh, lovely wide views of star fields with a system like this now now this one is uh, actually connected to um, a, a, a tracking device. Now, this is a, a, a thing called an Astro Track. There are lots of different models on the market now. But basically, what this does is it compensates for the rotation of the Earth so that you can take longer exposures with your camera. And um, so, what I could do is just take this camera and plug it directly onto, I could get rid of the Astro Track because obviously that's a, a little cost there. And you could just put the camera directly on the static tripod and you can still take fine images of the Milky Way and star fields um, using uh, this basic kind of equipment. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, um, you can, you can uh, get little bits of equipment like this, little, little, um, this little uh, timer that plugs into the camera so that you can get the camera to take images. Um, you can set the camera to the B or the bulb setting and get the camera to take longer exposures. Or maybe you can just set the camera to 30 second exposures, which is a quite a common thing that you can do. Um, just, just a couple of tips. One is that you must set the camera to manual focus. You must set the, the lens to manual focus and use the, the, the manual focus ring. Um, and the tip is to, uh, most 
cameras these days uh, through the screen, you can use a thing called live view and you can you can point the camera at a bright star and then you can focus very accurately with a zoom on the screen. And when you focused it, you just don't want to touch that focus anymore. And you want to then take pictures. Don't let the camera try to autofocus. It just won't work for you. Um, but anyway, I just I say just wanted to bring it back to Earth and um, I'll just quickly finish off if, if that's OK um, with some sort of images that you uh, can uh, get with uh, this kind of um, simple. Uh, here we go. So. Um, so, for example, these are images I took with this very camera um, with the, very, the same lens. Um, and this is a, a, an image of a comet I took back in 2015 with its comet Lovejoy with its tail stretching back past the Pleiades. And you can see there's a wealth of, uh, of lovely uh, uh, dark dust lanes and uh, nebulae like the California Nebula here. And uh, this is Aldebaran in Taurus, so the Hyades. And so you can see you can you can do a lot with this basic equipment. Uh, again, another picture of a comet, this time with a 200 millimeter lens that was plugged onto the same camera. Again, a 50 millimeter lens shot um, with uh, the Andromeda galaxy here and uh, uh, all sorts of constellations. I, uh, actually, I've annotated here. There's Cassiopeia and M33, the double cluster in Perseus. And, and, and this, this was made up of about eight one minute one minute exposures and you can see the milky way um and you know there's a lot you can do with uh, pretty basic uh camera equipment that you can get second hand these days for um you know uh not 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 a not a fortune should we say but um that that was uh that was really um that was really what i wanted to uh pass on uh robin if that's okay with you Yeah, hi. there's some amazing photographs there. Thanks very much for showing those. And I hope they've encouraged people to start to take some photographs of their own. You can start with just a camera on a tripod, as you say, and then quite possibly you'll be wanting to advance to taking pictures through a telescope, which is um, a, a lot more advanced, a lot more problem, but it can it can be done. And you don't need to spend a huge amount on the the subject so uh, so do go ahead to compare with some some hobbies i don't know but joining a golf club or something like that you you astronomy can be quite cheap really um indeed uh well i'm glad to say that uh, we've got another attendee uh, who should be with us shortly and that's uh, uh callum potter he's going to be in very shortly i hope um uh, we're trying to get him onto the onto the list uh, but now i'd like to go over to uh, john dolan again over in ireland and perhaps you can talk us through other things a few of the things you've been looking at uh, john Okay, we can see your desktop there. I can't hear you. John, you're muted. John, you're muted. Yeah, okay, sorry about that, Robin. Uh, but uh, now this is my observatory, and uh, I call it my time machine. My wife also calls it a time machine for different reasons because I spent too much time out, out there, according to her. Anyway, uh, I uh, about eight years ago, I dug a hole in the ground, put concrete in, and put a pier on it, and you'll see a, you'll see a 10 inch. Uh, Orion telescope sticking out of the top there and the roof slides off like that. Fairly easy to make up a standard uh, garden shed and uh, yeah it, for some reason oh there we go it's changing. So this is the imaging system I have in it at the moment there tonight I was using this system so you see a C11 and uh, a Zoe camera and a ZWO camera on the back and uh, it's, 
it's uh, there's a Barlow in there as well. Okay, and uh, that's a 120 uh, millim 120 uh, ZWO camera. Now, um, I use Maxim DL normally. I, normally, I image uh, uh, deep sky images, and I use Maxim DL to control the system. Uh, I, it's a Lossman D G11 mount on a permanent pier, and there's cable network to the house, so I control it from this desk that I'm sitting at now, normally. And uh, I, all I have to do is go out and open the roof, and uh, I do have to run out from time to time if, if it's raining and uh, so on, and close it quickly, as tonight. Okay, so um, there, there it is again, and uh, another C11 in, in the garden, you see, pointing up at the planets. Uh, I normally don't look at planets, half, I did years ago, but I got away from them, and uh, there we go. That's it. So that's my, my imaging system. These are the kind of pictures I would take. Uh, this is the Seven Sisters, of course, and you know the story, the Greek legend of the Seven Sisters. And uh, the Irish word for the, uh, the, that bunch of stars is called uh, trading. They call it flock of birds, it would be referred to as. And I think we mentioned before the other day about Subaru, the Japanese name for the Pleiades is Subaru. Uh, meaning unity. Okay, these are some more images, uh, just give you a sense of uh, the kind of work I do on it. M81 there and the M16, the Eagle Nebula, which is very low in the south for me. And uh, I, I was very lucky to get uh, anything at all there. Um, so that's uh, that's my, my setup. Um, I was going to run through the, uh, Robin, if you uh, allow me to run through something about the Irish Astronomical Society. I've been a member for a few years now, uh, but, so, but the society itself was founded in 1937, and uh, we're looking up now, as I say, for over 80 years. And uh, so those, those slides are taking a double click to change for some reason. Now, um, so it's, uh, the society was set up to promote an interest in astronomy and allied subjects, and we're now one of 15 uh, clubs in Ireland. But at the beginning, the Irish Astronomical Society was the only club, uh, society in Ireland, and the branches operated around the country. Now those branches have set up on their own, and they operate independently. So uh, we encourage people to join the local astronomy club always and uh, new members, as you know, are always welcome. And I think that should be said, particularly at times like this, uh, especially coming up to Christmas when people are looking for advice about buying telescopes and so on. There's nothing better than talking to somebody in a club. Now, uh, what we do, the meetings and talks, you, you, will, know, you, will, think, you will see here that um, these are the kind of activities most clubs get up to. And uh, we do telescope workshops and update, monthly updates on the sky. Um, we publish magazines and have been doing over the last 80 years. Uh, we have special interest groups, like many clubs, uh, general observers group, variable stars observers group, and an astrophotography group was set up recently. And they do some very uh, interesting work there. I'll show you some. Uh, examples. And we run an astrophotography exhibition every three years. And I, I'll show you some of the uh, images there before we stop. So, other, uh, and the other activities, we talk to schools, of course, and we go stargazing, uh, but we have to go down the country to get away from the light pollution. We're based in Dublin, and as you know, light pollution in a capital city can be drastic. And uh, we run campaigns and we participate in efforts to uh, reduce light pollution around the sea, around Ireland as a whole. And as you know, we've three, uh, you may know that we, we've three dark, international dark sky par parks and dark sky reserve down in Kerry, uh, which is uh, one of the darkest places, I was told by a, an international astrophotographer, one of the darkest places he's ever seen is looking out over the Atlantic. So uh, we go, uh, public outreach is out on the streets of Dublin and uh, you, you'll see there looking at the moon or something else. Uh, we were there that night under the street lamps and of course, horrible light pollution and so on. Here we are again at the seafront and uh, 
helping people to use their telescopes is, is an important area that we, you know, people get telescopes, don't know how to use them. So they're bringing them along to our street uh, activities and uh, we do, there we are. We're also associated very close, we're about seven kilometers away from uh, here, from the Dunsink Observatory, which is a very eminent uh, observatory. It uh, was opened in 1785 and has a distinguished history. Uh, so, uh, and you know that years ago, uh, Dublin was the place to come if you wanted a, a fine telescope. Grub, Grub telescopes were based in Dublin. And here's the example of the Grub telescope in Dunsink and uh, the, Grub uh, the Grub built that and uh, it's a refractor, 12 inch refractor. Okay, so we, we help uh, in public outreach down at the observatory and uh, we give talks to the public and show them the old equipment down there. Another shot of the observatory. Uh, we also, of course, give uh, astronomy presentations of various kinds and courses. And this is one down in uh, Nout, which is a passage grave down in County Mead. And there, here is the, where the passage graves are based. And we, we were down there, we had a regular event down there last year, uh, for example. Uh, and as you may know, uh, Newgrange is aligned with the rising sun on the 21st of December. And uh, so they were very interested in the sky there 5,200 years ago. And uh, so maybe they were the first astronomers and one of the first astronomers in Ireland. And uh, we call that the oldest observatory in the world at this point. Um, maybe somebody else has some other story, but we'll see that about that. So here's examples of us out at the passage graves in Nout, in a place, the whole complex is called Bruna Boyne, the Palace of the Boyne. And all of these passage graves are scattered around this particular area. And these, uh, we went there uh, quite a number of times last year and the year before and uh, to look at the sky. So here's the passage graves in the background. And I have a few more pictures of uh, the Irish Astronomical Society down at the uh, Passage Graves. And uh, this is a public outreach event. And it was, so, it was uh, booked out on every occasion that we ran the session down there. There was a limit on numbers because of the nature of the protected nature of the Passage Graves and so on. We had to be careful over there. So there is a couple of, I'll just quickly go through and you'll see the kind of activities that we get up to there, okay? And uh, that's an interesting photograph there with a laser being used to show the public the sky. So uh, important work, and I think many clubs uh, do this kind of work. Uh, around Dublin, I mentioned we're in the Dublin streets, we're called the, the Dublin Sidewalk Astronomers. And you know that uh, many cities in the world uh, have sidewalk astronomy events and uh, you have the Sydney Sidewalk Astronomers, the San Francisco Sidewalk Astronomers, we're the Dublin Sidewalk Astronomers. And of course, this was us out at the, uh, looking at Comet Neowise uh, earlier in the year, despite the, uh, well, things had eased down with the COVID crisis at that particular time, and we were allowed to get out and look. Uh, in Here's some examples of the kind of images that were on show during the images of Starlight exhibition that we ran. And uh, it was very popular. Uh, and uh, in three weeks, we had more than 10,000 visitors at this exhibition. I'll just show you another couple of images that were on show there. Okay, so uh, some good photographers there. Some of them won awards in the London uh, uh, International Astronomy of the Year competition. So Robin, that's it. I just wanted to go quickly through the kind of activities that we do. And I know many clubs do similar activities, but it's important to let people know that clubs are out there and uh, they can be used as a resource when people get telescopes or they have telescopes hidden away in an attic and they want to st start using them again. Yeah. Um, uh, I've been to uh, the Burren Star Party in the west of Ireland, and that was a fantastic sight. That's certainly one of the darkest skies that I've ever seen. Um, thanks very much indeed. That's that was really great to see all those those images. Now I'd like to introduce a 
uh, a, a new panelist that we've got is Callum Potter, who's over in Gloucestershire, and he joined a bit late. Uh, but uh, I, if I can ask Callum to unmute himself, please, or uh, the the director to unmute. There we go, Callum. What have you got for us? So um, I've had an awful lot of telescope and camera problems this evening, so it's just got going, and I think the weather's getting a bit grotty outside because this this view is looking rather rather horrible. But this is the uh, the Ring Nebula in um, in Lyra, uh, one of a class of objects called planetary nebulae, uh, and uh, it's uh, quite an easy thing to spot. It's sort of low in the west at the moment, um, and a small telescope is quite easy to find. But with uh, anything uh, with binoculars, it's a bit of a challenge, and of course you can't see it with the naked eye. Um, but it's interesting because planetary nebulae were first, uh, the term was first coined by uh, John Herschel, uh, sorry, William Herschel, uh, just after he discovered Uranus and he, he noticed all these other um, faint nebulae um, which were fairly circular in shape uh, and so he thought that maybe they were additional planets but they didn't move around in the sky like proper planets do. Um, um, so he realised that they weren't actually planets, but uh, he stuck with the name planetary nebulae and we still use that name for them today. So this is the, the ring nebula, um, SCA 57 is its um, designation. Um, not a very good picture of it, I'm afraid, but um, it's, it's, it's certainly there at the moment. Um, just uh, show you um, quickly, this is my uh, observatory. Uh, I've got a small dome in the back of my garden, it's about um, 10 feet across, and uh, this is the, uh, the telescope that I'm using at the moment. Um, it's quite common, quite similar to those of uh, uh, used for uh, observing Mars, it's a Celestron schmidt cassegrain 11-inch uh, uh, aperture. Um, I've got a, a filter wheel on it and uh, a camera. Uh, on the back end, so it's quite similar to the sort of planetary uh, the planetary images used, but uh, I have a slightly wider field of view, uh, and I use it for observing things like the planetary nebulae, uh, galaxies, and uh, globular clusters are, are my three main favourite targets. Um, so um, if I go back to uh, back to the, to, the, to the Ring Nebula. So it's, uh, it's known as the Ring Nebula. Um, it's just, you can see that it's a bit of a sort of smoky circle, really, uh, like, a, like a, a smoke ring. Uh, and uh, deep in the middle of that is a star, which is fairly faint. I think it's around about, I can't remember off the top of my head, maybe 14th magnitude, something like that. Um, but it's quite easy to pick up with the camera, but it's a bit hard to see with the uh, visually. Um, so um, uh, I'll uh, can go and try and find some other targets tonight. Um, it might be best to to hand over to uh, one of our other contributors if there's anyone else that's got something to to show at the moment. Hi, th I'll just start my video. Yep, thanks very much, Callum. That's that was nice. To that's a live image now of uh, the Ring Nebula M57. I remember showing that to the public once uh, a few years ago and one young girl said oh it's a donut star which is a very very good description really so that's what it is um, and we've also got another uh, panelist now and that's steve strickland and he's got some images of mars taken uh, a short while ago uh, a month or so ago so can i ask steve to uh, to come in now please i can see he says keep calm because he, unicorns are real so <laughs> maybe something else he's got for us <laughs> yes, good to say my daughter that one. Thank you. Can can you hear me? By the way, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, Steve Strickland here from uh, from Leeds Astronomical Society. Um, I'm afraid we don't have any uh, live uh, images for you. Um, okay. So um, can yeah, we? We've got you there. So th this is a clip uh, which I managed to take on the 25th of October. Um, and we had some pretty good uh, scene conditions at the time. Um, so, so this is pretty much the clip as it as it ran in real time. Um, and you can see the, the surface detail, uh, some of the dark markings that some of the other uh, panelists have, uh, have been describing. Um, and the South Polar cap is at about um, two o'clock, I would say, in, the, in that image. Um, 
So this would be um, what's well, probably a couple of a couple of weeks um, past the, the the opposition. So it was um, pretty much as uh, as good as I could uh, get, as I could uh, well as big as I could get it at the time. Um, one of the other things that uh, I'm unintentionally showing you there in that image is the uh, chromatic aberration. Um, this is a this is another clip which I took, which is probably. Uh, not as good as the, the first one, um, but you can see on the kind of bottom left it's gone blue and on the top right it's gone red. Um, Mars was about, I think, 30 degrees in the sky at the time I took this, uh, I took this image, but unfortunately um, to get the, the most out of the magnification I was plugging two Barlow lenses into each other and then a camera into the, into the end of the Barlow which um, certainly hasn't helped um, in any way. Um, but there we go. And th this is something which uh, I would have ideally liked to have shown you tonight. Um, and just to explain, we've seen some of those uh, fabulous uh, observatories with the, the domes and the, um, you know, some uh, quite sizable telescopes there. This is a, this is a much more basic affair. It's... Um, the Skywatcher 200, so it's eight inches as opposed to, I think we saw uh, 11 and uh, 14 inches. Um, and uh, it, it was really, it's a telescope in my back garden um, with uh, all the wires trailing into the, uh, some trailing into the house um, and me sat outside with a laptop on a table just recording this. Um, so, you know, anybody who's watching and think, well, thinking, well, I can't afford one of those observatories. This is some sort of reasonably affordable equipment. I won't pretend it's uh, uh, Skywatch 200 is uh, particularly cheap, but it's, um, you know, so it certainly doesn't break the bank. You could pick one up for about £500 new. Um, and I actually managed to get mine second hand. Uh, so this is uh, this is from the 27th of October um, when conditions um, weren't quite as good. I think I just I just struck really lucky on the on the 25th, managed to get everything set up and, uh, and get a couple of decent recordings. Um, you can see the effects of the wind here, just shaking the camera uh, or shaking the telescope rather around. Uh, so it's moving about quite a bit in the sky. Okay, Steve, can we, uh, that, that's a very nice image there. I, I think we can move now to uh, Ian uh, down, uh, Ian Sharp down on the south coast because he can show us how the images are processed. So um, thanks very much, Steve, yeah. and okay, over welcome. to you, Ian. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Robin. Let, let me um, share my screen again and... Uh, so um, what I'm hoping you're seeing now is I'm, I'm going to demonstrate um, how it is that we process these videos. Can you see my screen? Can you see um, a, a, a black and white image of Mars? Y yes, I can. Yeah. OK, so what, what I've done is I've opened up a video. You've been watching a lot of videos and you've been seeing color videos. Now, this is a demonstration of um, Mars taken with um, just a red filter. Um, to, to get really uh, very sharp images of Mars, uh, we use uh, black and white cameras, uh, monochromatic cameras, and we put um, red filters in and then we take, a, take a, a video. Then we take another video with green and another one with blue and we create high resolution uh, images of each color and then we blend them together to get to give us an RGB color composite. So I'm, I'm um, scanning through the frames and you can see quite clearly the difference between there's a sharp frame there but you can see how fuzzy they get look and you can see so here we've got um, a, uh, something like about 4,000 just over 4,000 frames that was taken over a, 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 um, something like a minute and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask this so I'm going to um, uh, scatter some um, points I'm going to tell the software to look at these places on Mars, uh, and I'm going to ask it to um, to align on these boxes. Now, I'm just going to scatter a few 
points. And, and what I'm going to get the software to do now is to analyze the video and it's processing away. It will only take um, a few seconds and it's now going through all of the frames and it's analyzing um, the, the, the frames for quality. So it's, it's now looked at all uh, 4,000 odd frames and it, this graph on the left, quality graph, is now showing you uh, from frame, the, the best frames are the highest quality on the left and you can see the quality going down at those fuzzy frames and oh, we can't see I, that graph actually ah right uh oh okay uh that's a shame uh all right let me just um a uh, new share and uh it must be a way oh here we go okay can you see that Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so what what the, there was there were two windows on my screen, but you were only looking at the 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 image. Now, what what happened there was this graph on the left is now showing all of the frames from the best down to the worst. Can you see that? Okay. Yep. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the software to stack the the top third. I reckon is about right. So I'm going to what I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it to ignore all the fuzzy ones and just. Um, just align and stack together um, the, the top third of all those frames. And it's doing that now. Okay. And it's nearly finished. And it's done that now. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to close this program. And um, you've come back to me and I'm going to, I'm going to run another program now to sharpen the image. So bear with me just one second while I open this up um, and I will find it in a second. Um, I beg your pardon, here we go. Okay, I'm just gonna run this now. I'm gonna open up now the resulting image that was created by stacking those together and I'll share my screen. Okay, so now I'm going to share again and you should now see another piece of software. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. so what I've done is I've opened up the stacked image. Now it still looks a bit fuzzy, but it's now um, a smoother looking and it's now the result of averaging together all of those third of the, the best frames together. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use a thing called wavelet sharpening, which is a, a, a way of sh uh, sharpening up uh, layers of the within the image. And now I've moved the slider over and I think you can now see quite a lot of details. Now, um, so I can, I'm, I've sharpened this right up and you can see all sorts of fine details that you couldn't see before. Now there's also this awful artifact running around the, uh, the, the, the limb of Mars on the right hand side. So we call that the, the Mars rind effect. And that is an artifact caused by processing. And we can just get rid of that with a bit of further processing. But this, this has now shown you now the result of stacking together uh, the best 33% of those uh, rather fuzzy images um, and uh, averaging out the noise and uh, amplifying the, the signal. And you can now see a lot of information. And what I would now do is do the same for the green images. I would then do the same for the blue images. And then I would go into another program and I would combine those together to create a color result, um, which I, I think I've got here. And um, I'll uh, show you that. And uh, this was the resulting image after processing um, of, of those uh, frames. So uh, that's the process we go through these days with uh, videos to produce sharp images of the planets. That's an absolutely beautiful image there, Ian. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see that you've managed to get such a, a, a brilliant uh, picture out of uh, what was quite a fuzzy one to start yes, with. Yes, and, and the blue the blue clouds here, there's, there's the, the North Polar Hood and the, the morning clouds here on the, on the right-hand limb. 
they were not on that red image. They were on the blue image because the blue images show the atmosphere of Mars and the red images show the, the, the albedo, the, the, the surface uh, details of Mars. So, yeah, so clouds on Mars as well as clouds here. And yes. talking of, of clouds, I gather it's clear now in Tewkesbury where Callum is, and he's got an image of M15 for us, which is a globular cluster. So if we can now switch over to Callum, um, at the uh, at his observatory over in Gloucestershire. If you could stop sharing your screen, please. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. That's great. Oh, Callum, all yours. Right. So um, this is um, uh, just just slewed my telescope across to, to M15 from uh, M57, and it got bang on it the first time, which was uh, amazing, really. Uh, it's quite an unusual event um, <laughs> with my telescope anyway. Um, and uh, here we have uh, Messier 15, which is a, um, a, a globular cluster. Um, it's a cluster of stars. These are quite old stars um, compared to uh, the stars that are in our local area uh, in, a, in a huge ball of stars, really. Uh, and they're in rather unusual orbits around our galaxy. Uh, and we think they're probably formed at the very early stages of, of, our, of our galaxy. Um, so uh, you can resolve the stars around the uh, around the outside uh, part of it. Uh, it's very it's very dense at the core, so on this short exposure, it's, it's a bit difficult to uh, and this representation on screen here is a bit difficult to see. Um, but like um, like the Mars uh, pictures, what we do is we take lots of, uh, of lots of exposures of this, uh, and then in some post processing software, we add those together and construct a, a final final image. Um, but um, that's M15. <coughs> me, that's M15 in Pegasus, and uh, it's uh, it's a lovely view, and it's quite an easy thing to find uh, with binoculars um, or a small telescope. Uh, and it's really one of the uh, the highlights at the moment. It's sort of in the in the south, really. The, the skies here are getting rather murky, so uh, I think probably that's going to be about it from from me. Personally. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Colin. Colin, for showing us that. And now to finish up, I'd like to go back to Dave Eagle, who's over in Northamptonshire. Thank you very much, Callum. Stop sharing it's a uh, quite a palaver to get one from one person to another it's not quite as simple as they do on the bbc hey there's dave Hello. right dave have you got an image for us to look at uh, well i've lost mars on the main scope because i think the wind must have uh, uh blown it off target but i have mars on the wide angle camera so if i can share that screen there and you should be able to see the wide screen as you saw it before so we've got cassiopeia here and down here is mars so there's mars and here's the square of pegasus and andromeda of course and you can just about i don't know if that comes over on your screen but you can just about see the andromeda galaxy just here as well yes we can just see that yep you can just about see that there so there you go so that's the why so cygnus is now starting to disappear we've lost um albirio over the edge there the lovely double star or is it a double star it's a lot of discussion about that one isn't there um but yeah that's starting to disappear off my view now but as i say mars is coming in quite nicely so you can see it on there great so thanks very much i can't show you mars through the telescope because i've lost it i'll have to go right. outside to uh, get it back in view and that'll take a little bit of time yeah. to do that okay well thanks very much dave and thanks to all our astronomers this evening for showing us the sky and showing us that it's actually possible for people in their back gardens to do some rather interesting observing and show us some super pictures of the sky and i hope that everybody watching will go and try and have a look at mars sorry we weren't able to come to everybody and show clear skies but uh uh, if you go out and if it is clear where you are, have a look for Mars, have a look through binoculars if you can. And if you have one of those old telescopes knocking around in the backyard um, in, underneath the bed or something like that, do dig it out, 
We've got the moon coming around in the next few days. And if you've never looked at uh, the moon through a telescope, do so. It will it will actually blow your mind. It's an absolutely fabulous thing to look at. So I'd like to thank you. Thank all our observers this evening. That's uh, Ian Strange, uh, Callum Potter, John Press, John Dolan uh, and uh, and of course, Dave Eagle. I've, oh, Steve Strickland as well over up in Leeds, who came in late. And uh, it's been a great evening. We've seen uh, quite a few things. And I know Agapios over in Cyprus process said uh, he's he's watching it from his sofa tonight and he said great image Dave so uh, it's glad to see some uh, some nice words from him as well and we look forward to seeing some more observing over the next few nights so with that thank you to everybody who's been joining thank you to our directors up in the gallery at the Royal Astronomical Society who have been switching carefully from one person to another and muting us and so on and we look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow night and the the, the show starts in the after in the early morning uh, well the, the sorry the mid morning at 11 o'clock for the schools and then at six o'clock we'll be we'll be back here uh, and uh, and we'll be observing from seven so good night to everybody thanks for watching bye bye thank you bye bye